Without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Michelle for our keynote address. Thank you. All right. Hi. I know I stand between you and drinks and unenviable position. Um, Lou, you could have just said, I work and I'm a mom, and that pretty much would have sums it up nicely. Um, you know what? Can I have the clicker from the back there? Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to really hit on what, it, uh, what my experience has been being in disruptive companies, being disrupted, um, and some of the things. I'm actually the, currently the chief marketing officer at IBM. I'm also helping TCV on the side. But some of the things I see from IBM about AI and where this is all going and how I think entrepreneurs like yourself and, of course, venture partners um, can take advantage of some of this. But let me start with a little bit of background. I've only ever operated in disruptive times, like many of you. Um, I started my career uh, at Site 59. Site 59 was a company I founded, last minute travel. We bundled and packaged airline tickets, hotel room nights, cars, events, and activities. Um, and you know, we were, we were based out of New York. Actually, we were located at Ground Zero. Um, and on September 10th, we were in you know, incredible conversations with several players to acquire us. Obviously, on September 11th, everything changed. Uh, our offices were two blocks off the towers. And that morning, uh, as I walked outside, I lived downtown and, and saw the, the sort of gaping holes. I got a phone call from our chief operating officer. And uh, an American Airlines ticket had just landed at her feet. Slow down. You hear me back there? All good? OK. So an American Airlines ticket, and that's how we knew, obviously, a huge tragedy had happened. And when you think about that, when you think about disruptive times, here we were excited, building the first dynamic packaging capability in the travel industry, and then all of a sudden, the world shifts, the world change. Um, clearly, for us, those shifts happened on multiple levels. Nobody, nobody wants to be in the business of selling last minute spontaneous travel on September 12th. Uh, but then on top of that, you have employees who have witnessed incredible uh, really life-altering situation. People saw things, we all saw things we never should have seen. We lost our office, we had, for, for a temporary period of a few weeks, we had customers stranded all over the country uh, who couldn't fly back immediately. Um, we had, you know, of course, the, the um, business dropped, you know, I mean, we went from burning about $200,000 a month with $2 million in the bank to burning a $1 million a month with $2 million in the bank. All the acquisition conversations were, were called off. So you can imagine what an incredibly disruptive time this was. Interestingly, uh, we, we decided at that point to really pivot. And this is one of those fundamental things about disruptive times. How quickly can you move? How agile can you be? Um, and we realized that so many of the travel companies were really dependent on air. Airlines went in and cut commissions, and so we started powering lots of different websites with our dynamic packages, which were high margin. Um, and as a result, Travelocity acquired us in March of 2002, and I went on to become the CEO of Travelocity pretty shortly thereafter, um, bringing you the lovely little roaming gnome. Any roaming gnome fans out there? He's, uh, he's still active, which is great. I've been also doing things like the Travelocity guarantee and all sorts of stuff, because at the time, Obviously, Expedia uh, was a fierce competitor. And now you look at the travel industry and you see how much the airlines themselves have developed, the hotels themselves have developed, and now a whole new generation and a whole new breed of startups and entrepreneurs and travel are redefining what it means to play in the travel space. And you see hotel chains and airlines aggressively looking to partner with this new breed of entrepreneurs, this new breed of travel partners that talk about experience and that use data in new and fundamental ways and that change the experience of a traveler. And, and that, to me, is super exciting. Um, I then joined, after a, a, about 10 years between Site 59 and Travelocity, I joined City. I joined City the day after the stock price had gone from you know, a high of 80-something dollars to 99 cents. Um, we were almost delisted from uh, NASDAQ because we had dropped below a dollar. Um, financial crisis happening. You can imagine the profound implications. You've got frustrated shareholders, you know, extraordinarily angry regulators, employees who had lost all their personal savings and wealth that they invested. You know, people going to branch branch employees getting uh, protested with Occupy Wall Street and branches employees going to cocktail parties and barbecues, local neighborhood barbecues, and having people kind of curse the banking industry um, for the damage it had wrought. So for me, being at City was this extraordinary time in terms of rehealing the brand, bringing things like City Bike, reimagining the digital experience around the world for our 40 million uh, global, or more than 100 million global consumers in 40 countries, um, and working with lots of great, great, great entrepreneurs. We established something called the Innovation and Venturing Group, 
um, where we reached out, and it still exists in Silicon Valley, run by a good friend, where we started to reach out to all those amazing entrepreneurs in FinTech who were doing things differently. And part of it was because they weren't regulated, part of it because they were taking care, you know, advantage of new situations and bringing ideas and feedback and, and ways of, uh, for city to do business differently. And that ecosystem was a large part of city's transformation when I think about it. I had been associated uh, with uh, guilt for quite some time. I had been on the board of Gilt, and I finally decided to become CEO of Gilt to take over the business. I knew we had a big haul in front of us. Um, but Gilt, of course, was the first flash company online, discounted sales, you know, we, and we grew you know, really at a, at a very torrid pace, reaching over 700 million in, in sales fairly quickly. Um, but we made mistakes too. We expanded into categories we shouldn't have. We had to pull ourselves back. And then you saw retail giants, and I think we got a little bit complacent um, early on, especially. You know, but then you see retail giants coming in and starting to discount and promote and the like. And so that push and pull of disrupting, but also being disrupted and thinking about what is that sustainable advantage, um, you know, was was a real part of my experience at Guild. Extraordinary creative ability, incredible entrepreneurial team. Um, really new models in terms of technology, uh, teams and technologists that ran themselves by KPIs, not by roadmaps, which were, was sort of fascinating for me as we developed a engineering-led culture. Um, and then, of course, we sold here recently. Um, throughout it all, I've been involved with TCV for a whole number of years. Uh, I just have huge respect and admiration for the team there. And a lot of the guys, and there are a lot of guys there, uh, have been my mentors for a very long time. So I've stayed uh, with them, and, and through the years, I've gotten to see you know, some extraordinary companies. And now, as chief marketing officer at IBM, a position I took up uh, in October, again, you're seeing this incredible push and pull between the startups, the, the new ecosystems, the cloud companies, the SaaS companies, the cognitive companies developing and pushing IBM out of its traditional turf of enterprise uh, software and, and computing. And so IBM is in the process of, once again, really transforming and making a meaningful shift in not just strategy, but in the way we go to market and the way we manage companies and clients. You know, so when I step back, all of this stuff is a study in contrast. Uh, and disruptive times to me is always a study in contrast. There's always this sort of yin and yang and push and pull. We all know these extraordinary uh, numbers, the acceleration of technology, the, you know, we went from internet penetration of sort of, you know, 1%, uh, you know, only 20 years ago to now, of course, mobile penetration is now almost like 85, 90% all the way around the world. Um, social media is just incredible. You know, you look at these stats where you have, you know, 2 billion photos uploaded daily. That is dramatically more than ever existed in the world, even just 20, 30 years ago. And so this incredible amount of data, much of it unstructured data that's coming to bear, is extraordinary. You know, one million friend requests every single minute on Facebook. Just, just an incredible how interconnected the world has become. And of course, you know, we don't often hear this, but that's producing this real decline in poverty and this real rise in, in economic freedom. So if you look at the people who make less than $1.90 a day, that has dropped precipitously over the past you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And that, that is really an incredible statistic. But at the same time, we know that income inequality is accelerating. We know that, you know, that, that all of a sudden we're seeing these new movements upending the norm, whether it's Brexit or the 2016 elections or Black Lives Matter, arguably even women's role in sort of pay equity debates. Um, you see these studies in contrast, technology, you know, the advancements, disruption, helping so many, and yet in some ways creating the haves and the haves nots. And as all of us as entrepreneurs and venture partners, you know, we, we tunnel in and we think about our business, but it operates in the context of a larger society. One of the areas I'm most passionate about and one of the reasons I joined IBM is when I think about that next wave of innovation, to me, cognitive computing, you know, what that will enable for all of the entrepreneurs in the audience and the businesses you will build by pulling those APIs and creating applications and businesses and concepts that change healthcare, financial services, you know, in, tech, in fundamental ways, to me, is the most profound thing we've seen in quite a long time in the, in the technology space. AI systems, of course, can understand 
Uh, they can understand, of course, the natural language, but also all the dark data. So there is 80% more data that is unstructured video, images, and the like than there is clean data that, that is easily read by programs and computers. Um, and cognitive computing can understand all of this and bring all of this to bear. Uh, cognitive computing AI can reason can learn and can interact in natural language. And all of this creates really unprecedented opportunities. Um, as I think about that in healthcare, uh, 60 Minutes just did an amazing story about how a bunch of doctors are using Watson's APIs in healthcare to better diagnose uh, at UNC all the protocols for, for cancer treatments, um, diabetes, education, uh, Sesame Street is using a bunch of APIs to figure out how to tailor individual learning plans to children all over the world, including in refugee camps. Um, teachers in the department, uh, through the Department of Education, over a million teachers are using AI APIs to figure out how to tailor lessons for students, and so they really understand what that particular student needs. Um, marketing, we're seeing this more and more where we have the ability to interact with systems that learn, that can provide personalized recommendations, that can chat, um, and the like. Financial services, the ability for AI to better sort through risk models and risk criteria and figure out where you know, financial risk lays and fraud lays is, is extraordinary. And of course, societal. Um, but again, like everything, this sort of, oh, let me play this quickly. This is just a quick video on Watson. Yes, the APIs are IBM, big, big IBM, but there's not a single innovation there that wasn't produced by a company, a startup, an entrepreneur, all the applications. People are pulling down APIs in the AI world and figuring out how to start companies, run businesses, change the way traditional companies interact. And to me, that's really exciting as I think about the next wave of entrepreneurship. But of course, while we all tunnel down and build our businesses, there are these larger societal implications. Um, increased automation, what will that mean? Look at the election we just went through. You know, what happens when, when robots can manage a lot of the work that traditional humans do today? Um, what are the changing education requirements? What do we have to do as leaders of companies to make sure we're hiring the right people, bringing the right people on board? Um, what about the, the you know, humankind's concept of work? If a lot of this stuff gets automated, what does that do to our sense of work and our sense of leisure? And what are the implications? It's, it's really profound. Um, bigger gaps in wealth distribution, of course, the potential exists. Security, an interconnected world, a world of IoT, the worlds that you all are building, what does that mean from a cybersecurity perspective? And finally, of course, just broad questions of ethics. Who runs the cognitive systems? They run themselves. And so what does that mean? And so I think as all of us build these next generations of companies, these questions loom large. And it's very critical that we all stay highly educated and participative in the debate. So before I ask Sean up here to talk and uh, hear your questions, I thought I would end with, what do I think makes companies that are great disruptors, the entrepreneurs that build awesome companies, the venture companies that find those amazing companies, um, and even those companies that continually reinvent, what traits do they share? The first one that I've observed over time is they're really obsessive. They're maniacal, they're focused. They start with a brilliant thing. Great entrepreneurs aren't trying to boil the ocean. They're not trying to solve lots of problems. Um, they stumble when they move too quickly onto the next thing, as guilt did. 
Um, and so the great entrepreneurs are maniacal and focused and passionate about doing one great thing and, and really understanding that entire chain. Secondly, they're always passionate, always customer-centric, always unsatisfied, generally unvarnished, and always transparent. There's an amazing commencement address, if you've never heard it, by David Foster Wallace. Anybody hear the Kenyan commencement address? Um, it's worth listening to, and, and David Foster Wallace um, did this incredible speech where he said, you know, he starts it by saying there's two little fish swimming in the river, and a big fish swims by, and, and uh, the big fish says to the little fish, you know, what do you think about the weather today? And they both just kind of go, yeah, huh? And, and the thought is that you're so unaware of your own reality. These fish have no idea. They, all they know is water. That all of us as entrepreneurs, as leaders, we get trapped in our own mental blocks and our own ways of thinking. And being a great entrepreneur, busting out of that is about being unvarnished, unsatisfied, and really sort of immensely client-centric. Um, I love Nike, I'm on the board, of course, so I'm biased, but I love how often they reinvent themselves, how, how in endlessly they think the journey is always, you know, they're always at the beginning of this journey. They refuse to get complacent. They're unvarnished in their view of the competition, and they're always obsessing about the next step of that journey. And to me, that's one of the great reasons they have themselves continued on this path of disruption. Creating space for freedom and serendipity. We all know the famous 20% rule from Google. There's always been a lot of debate about whether it actually happened and whether people really use 20% of their time to pursue you know, serendipity, probably not. But there were amazing innovations that came out of people who did use that time. And the, you know, when Google talks about it, when the leadership talks about it, they talk about even just the concept that you can raise your hand at any point in time and say you want to devote I, your, your work and your time to not just you know, gathering, but hunting, big ideas, next-gen things, without a real concrete purpose, that that's inspired the culture of Google endlessly. Slaying misfits, failures, bureaucracy, and zombies quickly. This is a place where you, know, you often see companies, entrepreneurs scale, they get to a certain size, and then they sort of peter off, or they kind of flatline. Um, and to me, it's often because they start to get bureaucratic, they start to get a little bit big, they, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they start to believe their own hype and they're not good enough about ridding that culture and going back to the core of what they, what they were when they were a startup. Um, I love how Zappos will train you as a customer service rep and then give you money after your training period to leave. They'll give you $2,000 to leave. And the thought is, if you're not gonna fit in here and you don't buy into this culture, if you're a misfit, take the money and leave rather than stay around and poison the culture we've created. And my last one is really for the women in the room. And there's not uh, enough women entrepreneurs. There's not enough women in tech. And there's not enough women in the venture world. Um, and you know, I, as a mom of a six-year-old and eight-year-old who's super passionate about being a great mom as well as obviously an entrepreneur, I wrote a, a letter to my daughter when she was first born. Her name is Auden Grace. And I wrote a letter to her about the meaning of the word grace. And to me, it means, I hope, and this is what I wrote to her, that she dreams big, that she is bold, that she's aspirational, that she takes risks, that she has a purpose in life and a mission, whether that's to help society or to build a company. I hope she has large dreams and that she has the confidence and the audacity to pursue them. But I also know that if she does, and I've experienced this, if she does, she's going to occasionally misstep. She's going to occasionally fail. The world is moving so fast. She's going to make mistakes. She's going to let herself down and let others down occasionally. And for me, the ultimate definition of an entrepreneur, the ultimate definition of somebody with great conviction and passion is that they can pick themselves up and learn from that mistake and carry on with their journey. And to me, that requires enormous grace, which is why her middle name is Grace. And so for the, for the women in this room, I implore you, keep doing exactly what you're doing, bring other women along. Um, and, and we all, while it's been an extraordinary time for women in business, um, the best I firmly believe is yet to come as we have more and more women enter the fields of venture and technology. With that, let me bring up Sean and answer your questions. Thanks, guys. Well, Michelle, first off, let me say, wow, that was uh, amazing. And so I have a ton of questions. I could go in a lot of different directions. But you know our audience um, is comprised a lot of uh, new entrepreneurs, you know, great thoughts, looking for capital, and, and you've been through that. What, yeah. on actually both sides of the house. Yeah. Yeah. What, what advice could you give to the entrepreneurs out there that look at you and say, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to grow a company. I have an idea. I want to grow a company. I want to raise capital. I want to get to $700 million yeah. and potentially sell. What advice would you give? 
Yeah, so I've done it a lot, <laughs> raising capital and, and, and giving capital and you know, being on the other side of the equation. I think, it's, I think that there's things that are really critical. Um, number one, you crystallizing what your business is. I think too many times entrepreneurs come in and you know, they're going to be this and 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 having that one great idea, that one sort of gem of, of how you're taking on the world and the potential, the market potential for that is critical. The second thing is, you know, I'm a big fan of realistic optimism. You know, sometimes you come in and I see entrepreneurs that come in with such crazy projections that they just lose credibility fast. Um, now, of course, no, none of us want to be overly conservative. I see the venture guys smiling here, but you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a real credibility killer when you come in and say, you know, we're going to be a billion users in nine months, or you know, and we're going to be just like Snapchat or Instagram, and you know, we took Facebook's curve and we applied it to our idea, and you know, look, we're, we're this size. So I think being um, optimistic, of course, you're passionate about the business, but really being thoughtful and realistic about uh, about the business model is critical. And, and the third thing I think is understand your unit economics. You know, there have been times and occasionally companies that can defy the laws of having great unit economics, but by and large, you know, the chicken comes home to roost and you really need to understand what are the unit economics of your business and, and you know, can you afford customer acquisition? What's the strategy there and like? Um, and then finally, I just think it's really about the team. You know, uh, at the end of every conversation I've ever been in, on the venture side or the funding side. And at the end of every conversation I've ever heard uh, spoken about me and my team as we've tried to seek funding, the conversation always ends with what about the team? Is the team strong enough? Are there, yes, of course, if, if you get through those other hurdles of the ideas and all the rest, is it a great team? Do they function well together? You know, and, and um, I think great money follows great teams. And so, you know, making sure that you have the courage and the conviction to put really strong people around you that share your values, yes, but that are also going to challenge you, uh, make you think differently, and, and make the company better is critical. So when we think about disruption, there was two major events that happened in our world, in our world, really 9-11 in the financial crisis, and yeah. you lived both of those actually on the front lines, and most people would be rattled. What, does, does anything rattle you? <laughs> and, my, and if my, so, yeah. we, how, how did you work through those? And, and yeah. maybe talk about some of the Plenty emotions. Plenty rattles me. Um, you know, I think, uh, I guess a few thoughts. In both cases, I've never thought about this before, but in both cases, the thing that pulled me through is I was passionate about the team. And I didn't want the end of the Site 59 story to be about the towers coming down. And I didn't want all the effort and energy and passion and hard work, not just me, but other people put into the company to, to end. Um, and the same with the financial crisis. I didn't feel it was fair that teams that were working incredibly hard you know, were getting uh, beat up on social media and in, in branches where they worked. I didn't think, I thought there was a lot of wrongdoing on behalf of financial companies. But I think the teams of people who are hard at work every day to make sure that people could access their money and get loans and, and the like um, were deserved leadership and commitment and passion and courage. And I think in both cases, I became extremely focused on, and clients, you know, I think is the other piece of this. It's, it's you know, you think about customers stranded all across the country, you think about rebuilding faith in travel, you think about rebuilding faith in financial services, you think about customers who lost their homes because of bad mortgage practices. So whether it was good or bad, you know, that, that conviction for clients, that conviction for teams uh, has, has sort of always driven me. So thinking back to when you started uh, Guilt, perhaps, can you, can you maybe give a story to the audience about a time where you were questioning yourself and challenging you know, yeah, the success? Yeah. Always, and, and I didn't start Guild. I was on the board from early on, but I joined as CEO about halfway through. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. If you're, if you're, you know, this is why that David Foster Wallace speech means something to me, because it's about not letting yourself become a slave to your own sort of little Waldorf you know, view of the world. And, having the courage to have other people challenge and yourself challenge that worldview. And so, um, look, you know, at, at Guilt, um, uh, we, were, we got too complacent. We, we launched, some of this is before my time as CEO, but we launched, I was on the board, 
so I bear culpability, we launched into new categories like taste and travel and other stuff, and we didn't realize, and we weren't, you know, we were sort of believing our own hype and our own success, and we weren't, um, we didn't pierce that bubble of arrogance, frankly, um, to say, well, you know, are we good enough at fashion? You know, do we really have the capacity to tackle these other very different businesses? Um, and so, you know, you always, when you're building a business, you know, you're always, I think, if you're a thoughtful leader, you're always thinking about, yeah, what did you do right, but what could you have done better, and what, did, what could you have done differently? Um, otherwise, what are you? You know, what are you? You're not growing, and, and to me, that, that's, that's my fear. You know, my worst fear, the thing that would rattle me the most is the thought that I'm not growing and I'm not learning and that, you know, my next month ahead as a leader isn't going to be better than the ones before. So I have about 100 questions here. <laughs> I do want to talk about IBM, but I, I did want to open it up to the audience. I, I know there's some entrepreneurs that may want to pick your brain on a few things, so I'd love awesome. to open it up. Uh, Over to you up guys. There. They're all like, whatever yeah, drinks. <laughs> Hi, Come Michelle. On. Yes. Uh, Michelle, a question a couple months ago, uh, read an article, it was by somebody at IBM, concerning your uh, ongoing transformation and the pivot into user-centric design and the impact it's had on the marketing teams. I think there's a lot of merit for the entrepreneurs here uh, to make sure that whatever product that they're driving towards bringing to the marketplace has differentiation. And uh, maybe you could spend some time on that, please. Sure, yeah. I mean, part of IBM's transformation is a transformation of how we work. It's not just about the products, right? It's about how we work. And so there's a couple things that have been fundamental in, in IBM's shift. I sit on the floor. I sit out in the open with everybody. I sit on the floor with design thinkers and, and usability labs and maker space and you know, all sorts of stuff you wouldn't normally associate with IBM. Um, but I would say two, two big shifts. One is this notion of user and design thinking where you know, we tackle problems early on from the perspective and you see post-it notes everywhere and rooms of people brainstorming about user experience before we get into you know, all the sort of architecture and, and technical conversations. What do we really want people to, uh, to, to think and feel and experience? So there's just a huge emphasis on training people and user design and experience and then actual physical spaces being built all around the country to, to give teams much more flexibility to generate that kind of thinking. Uh, IBM's been the largest hire of design talent uh, in the world. I think, I think we're actually the largest agency in the world technically now too. So bringing in those people who can inform the way we build is critical. The second thing that we're doing is we're really, and, and I don't know if it'll be a success or not, but it's something I'm very passionate about, which is how do we think about agile in the marketing context? So all of you are familiar with building agile teams in a, a development environment. But what does agile mean in other functional disciplines like marketing? And so starting to break down the traditional functional dimensions of marketing where you would say, you know, we have uh, acquisition marketers, we have paid, we have social, we have, you know, CRM and retention and loyalty and blah, blah, blah. Um, it, now we're actually putting together these small diamond teams that have sort of these ingredients in one team sit together and bring campaigns, you know, through soup to nuts in a much faster time frame and, and with analytics sitting with them as a member of that, of that small team um, to measure and, and to iterate effectively on success. So, those are some of the things that, as we transform the way we work, um, which is critical, we're trying to bring a different level of agility and customer centricity to, to marketing. There's a question. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I read online a couple months ago that uh, Watson, the team or the, the whole group, moved from New York to Germany. Is, is that true and, and why was that done? No. <laughs> um, what, what we did do is we uh, just created a massive experience center in Germany. So the Watson team is all over the place. Um, uh, Watson, uh, when you think about Watson, there's, it started with IBM Research. How many of you remember Watson playing Jeopardy? Um, Watson beating Jeopardy, beating Ken Jennings. So Watson started as a, a massive research project, and IBM invests billions of dollars every year in just sort of long-term research that you know, nobody, nobody touches or directs. Um, and Watson initially came from there. Uh, and, and then Watson has been built over time with engineers from you know, various parts of the world. Um, there was a huge experience center that is in New York at Astor Place, where I sit, um, a Watson experience center where we can bring clients in and they can really interact with Watson and see the different capabilities, the APIs, how to, um, how to take those APIs and build businesses, build applications. 
Um, and there's another big internet, uh, Watson Center that just opened in San Fran and one in Munich. Um, the Munich one is particularly focused on IoT, so the Internet of Things. And so the entire experience center there is really focused on interconnectedness um, and the industrial sector with, inter uh, with the Internet of Things. Good question, though. Hi. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for your comments on your daughter. That's really sweet. Very nice of you. Uh, my question really has to do with no work. It's 100 million people are out of work today. And I envision many, many more people not being industrial components. Industrial components. So my question is, how do you see that playing out and your children, for example? Sure. I mean, obviously, they may be highly functional people, but there may be a case where we just have a leisure culture. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's one of the implications I talked about. You know, what a, what a profound thought. Um, I think it was Keynes who said in the 1930s that by 2030, we would work less than 15 hours a week, um, which now seems pretty, you know, either shockingly wrong or very precious. I'm not sure. Right now, I feel shockingly wrong. But um, look, technology and innovation, every massive period we've been through has ultimately benefited society. It's ultimately been good for income, poverty, health, longevity, infant mortality rates, uh, gender equality, you know, generally every movement we've been through has done that. I think for the first time you see this with the elections, people are wondering, is this next, are, is it really good for me? Is free trade good for me? Am I being left behind? Is automation going to leave me behind? Um, are jobs leaving, you know, and, and I mean, I was with Bill Gates and he was telling me about a, a, a maid he has that is a robot you know, that can judge context and pick up a glass and say, that soda can is cold, I should leave it. This soda can is warm, I should throw it out. And so, you know, what does that mean for, for the service industry, you know, for, for so many of the, the jobs that um, potentially can be automated, of course, in, in, you know, car and long haul transportation, but even in, you know, in, in factories and, and restaurants and the like. And so I think the, the onus as always is on us. The onus is always is on us to understand these things, to think about these things, and to advocate for, you know, better, fair, more equitable ways of preparing the next generation, including my children, for the world they're going to inherit. IBM has been very active on this topic, as you would imagine. There's a whole coalition called Open API, Open AI, which is really talking, you know, in, in the best case world, artificial intelligence is really augmented intelligence, you know, where it's man and machine. Um, and that's what we all got to work for, because that future is a good one. Uh, Michelle, uh, we all remember David Ogilvie's famous saying that in marketing, uh, I, I know the 50% of my marketing budget is, is wasted. I just don't know which, which 50%. Yeah. So here you are, Bullshit chief marketing now. officer. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're chief marketing officer of IBM. Uh, how do you define success? Yeah. Uh, it's it, uh, all of us. So who, who are entrepreneurs, we think about this all day. How do we define a success today, yep. next month, next year? Uh, how do you define success, and what, uh, what lessons would you give uh, to us? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, from, from when David said that, there's been tremendous innovation in multi-touch attribution models. And, um, and frankly, I think this is a place uh, where you know, we're really at the beginning of understanding. Traditionally, there were market mix models, which predicted above the line spend. And of course, in the digital era, we're also used to sort of things like last touch attribution. And now more and more models are getting sophisticated on multi-touch attribution. So I can run my marketing budgets through simulations um, and really understand you know, what contributed um, to what. So one of the things, I'm, I'm, and I'm very passionate about this topic. I could talk about it forever. But um, I have brought to IBM is much more rigor and discipline, some around the technology and tools we're using, but about the process of standing up and asking for dollars. You know, I actually believe that marketing budgets shouldn't be fixed. I believe they should be um, treated in a very variable way. You, you have to have some sort of, when you're a big enough company, brand building and above the line consistency. But I do think that you know, the more and more we set and establish guidelines for our teams, whether it's ROI or month payback or CAC to LTV or, or the like, you know, that we should hold accountable. We should think about the marketing spend as an accordion. You know, what could you put in? How much more could you put in if you wanted to stay within this ROI threshold or this CAC to LTV threshold or this month payback threshold? Um, and it puts the onus on marketers when you do that, which I think is the other benefit of it, is not just thinking about the acquisition dollars, but understanding the funnel and yield and retention and cohorts and all these other places that marketing can have a bigger role. 
So ultimately, how do I measure my team? You know, I'm, I'm obsessed on, on four things. One is building brands with distinctiveness um, and cutting through. I, I tell my team at uh, IBM every day we should think of ourselves as challengers. We should think of ourselves as a challenger brand. That should be our mindset. Everything we do has to punch through, has to be distinctive. We have to stop all this sort of blah, blah, blah category stuff. Um, secondly, we have to understand what every dollar drives, and we have to get better at that every single day and every single month. Um, third, we have to bring much greater client centricity to the organization. So we're now championing MPS, win-loss analyses, when we lose deals, score, offering management scorecards, product scorecards, and the like, to bring that richer sense of user experience and customer centricity. And then, of course, lastly, I hold them accountable for you know all, all of us for upgrading our skills, you know, for being sort of great marketers, and for constantly keeping track of an of a ever dynamic and ever changing field. I saw one over here. Yes. Hi. Thanks. I was curious, um, with all the experiences you've had, and with your look back as a manager, what you've learned about what you find to be the right style for you in terms of nurturing a team and striking that balance between. And I hate to say this, especially as a woman, um, yeah. having been in the position a little myself, I found the nurturing side too natural and, and you sort of yeah, finding yeah. the boundaries versus nurturing. So I was just curious on the look back for you now, what you would say about what you found to be your seat's sweet spot yeah, as a manager. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a hard one for all of us to answer as leaders, right? What's our style? I would say the best advice I got at a young age when I was at BCG was a, 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 man, a partner. Who, um, who came to me and said, Michelle, you know, you have right now the most important thing you can do. He's like, you're going to do great things, I have no doubt, but the most important thing you can do is you have a toolbox. Start building new, new leadership tools. Start adding. Right now, you know, you've got three. This is your comfort zone. Figure out how to expand that um, and authentically. Um, uh, that was really good advice because different situations call for different, you know, different styles, and different people need different styles from you. If you're a great educator, you understand the learning style of your students. If you're a great leader, you understand the learning style of your team. And so, that was one thing I thought about a lot. You know, uh, how, to, how to, you know, flex different leadership muscles when situations or, or individuals require. The second thing I would say, though, is authenticity matters most of all. I am a team person through and through. Um, I am. I'm not hierarchical, I, I call spade a spade, I believe firmly in understanding who the people are who are awesome and getting obstacles out of their way. I will shine light back on them, I will go to bat for them, that is who I am. And I can't authentically be different than that. Um, if some people think that's nurturing, you know, fine. I think it's being a great leader. So I think don't, don't, um, don't let yourself get trapped, you know, into what others think is the traditional definition of leadership or the traditional style of leadership. Nobody I know doesn't think I'm incredibly tough. Um, uh, probably my kids <laughs> might not think that sometimes because I can be a bit of a pushover with them, but um, tragically. But, but uh, uh, especially my son, he's just so adorable. Um, I'm such a little manipulator. Um, but you know, I think this notion of be who you are, ha you know, take your style and know that's who you are. Work on expanding the edges um, but don't ever let somebody else define what great leadership wow. means. That's great advice. Last That's a yes, question. Sir. Here. Having worked for several large corporations, there's a lot of bureaucracy and complacency. How did you deal with that in these big corporations? Yes. A, a few things. Another topic I'm passionate about. One, I'm incredibly focused on what I'm there to do. Um, and I, I just told you my four priorities for IBM. Like, I'm maniacal about those four. I, you know, spend my time on those four. Um, secondly, I'm incredibly conscious of my time. I leave the office every day at 5. I have since my daughter was born. Um, I'm home by 5.15, and then I work 8 to 11 at night. And so that ruthlessness about using my time well I tell my team, I, so, so every quarter, I, when I'm on a long flight, I'll have my assistant print out how I spent my time. And I'll think about, you know, did my time match up with the, four, the things I said I had to do that were going to make the biggest difference? And if I'm spending too much time on the crap that is, you know, this meeting, that meeting, this approval process, that approval process, I will blow it up. Um, and I will either defer it to somebody else or I'll tackle the problem head on. But, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I asked my team, I did a video the other day, and I said, do, do three things for me at the end of each day, just three minutes before you leave. Number one, ask yourself, did you build somebody else or somebody else's idea up? Did you do something that advanced someone else's idea? Um, because that's important. 
Number two, did you do something that were you breakthrough for a client? Did you do something that you thought was distinctive and breakthrough for a client? You know, get out of your comfort zone, take a risk, and something that was, and number three, if you stare at your calendar right before you leave, look at your calendar, did you spend time on the things that will move the needle the most for IBM? Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's that kind of discipline, you know, it's that kind of discipline to say, am I building other people up? Am I being radical enough and differentiated enough for my clients and my customers? Am I doing something that challenges the status quo? And am I spending my time on the things that are going to move the needle the most for this company? And if you go through too many days of saying no, 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 you got to make a change. You have to make a change. Question over here. Um, yes. Have you ever felt that being a woman has been a barrier to you? I know that you know it happens often. Your confidence exudes otherwise, but um, <laughs> if you can give any advice on that or, or situations that you've been in to kind of rise above that. Um, yeah. That'd be great. Sure. Look, all of us go through, I think men and women, we all go through periods of, you know, great confidence and struggles. There's no, there's no two ways about it. There's no path to leadership and to success that isn't built out of a roller coaster. It just, just doesn't happen. Um, I think that, have I ever felt that it, it's been a barrier being a woman? Um, no, no. Have I had my share of bullshit? Yes, absolutely. Um, has it happened more than I would like? Absolutely. Um, and I could, I could walk you through, you know, examples that would, that would make your, your, you know, hair stand up. Um, but at the end of the day, I am who I am, and my style is what it is. And, um, and I'm not going to be different. And I'm not going to sit down and be quiet about it. You know. And, and so, I, you know, sometimes I think it's an advantage. You know, sometimes I think. Um, uh, you know, being comfortable in your skin is, can be, and, 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 you know, and being a woman, uh, being a mom, sometimes I think these are real advantages to leadership. Um, so, you know, I, I think that we are in a situation as women um, where we live in a country and in a time that is unprecedented in terms of opportunity. This didn't happen, this wasn't the case 30 years ago, it wasn't the case 50 years ago, it's not the case in many countries around the world today where young girls would give their arm and leg to sit where you sit. And so I take that responsibility really heavily. Do I think we're at our, some apex? Do I think the world is fair for women? Absolutely not. Look at the, the freaking pay equity gap that doesn't change year after year after year after year. I mean, arguably look at the elections. Um, you know, so. That, that we just went through and, and some of the dialogue about women. So, um, no, it's not fair, but am I going to let that um, keep me back? No. Don't let it hold you back either. Well, with that, uh, I see a red light here. Um, we are out of time, but I want to thank you, Michelle. Thanks, I really Sean. appreciate you being here. And a round of applause Thanks, for Michelle. Guys.